I am a walking contradiction, which is why this video is literally perfect. We'll see what comes out of this. Is this where I dramatically sip on my coffee because I am about to spill some real tea and expose myself? Hello, good morning, friends. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new. My name is Mel and today I bring you guys the contradictions book tag. Now, if you guys know me, I am constantly saying I love fantasy and then I went, but I hated these books or I don't really like contemporary romance, but then I loved these books. And so this book tag is to highlight exactly that. What is something that you love that you didn't necessarily love this time around or something that you've said before that directly contradicts another statement that you've given at another given time? I thought it would be really fun to do a community interaction video to start out the year with and this one came about. I felt like it was perfect. And I also felt like it gave you guys the perfect opportunity to also answer the questions down in the comments. So feel free to interact with the questions as we go if you have an answer for each and every single one of them or some of them. And so because I think it's pretty self-explanatory, we're gonna get right into it, but before we do, I'm also going to introduce the sponsor of today's video, which is Book of the Month. Now, if you guys have been here for a while, you'd be no stranger to Book of the Month, to my love for them, to how many times I have worked with them. I think actually this February marks a year since I started working with them, and they are the longest running sponsor of the channel. They've just been incredibly supportive and a joy to work with. But if you guys are not familiar with the service, Book of the Month is essentially a super popular and fast growing online book service for readers, and their mission every single month is to promote new and emerging authors and give readers books that they love. They have a selection of five books every single month from a variety of different genres. You pick one, you get this stunning blue box every single month, and they also have a wide array of add-ons that you can also add onto your box. How it works is that their team every single month sets out on this incredible fantastical journey of vetting hundreds of books and giving readers their choice from a curated selection of early and new release titles that you can spend once more less time researching and more time reading. Miss Book of the Month is also risk-free, meaning that you can cancel any month at any time and you will not be charged for that month, so it's super convenient to cater to whatever system you want, so it's pretty, pretty easy. Let's get on to the January picks. For their contemporary fiction this month, we've got A Black Cake. This book, Brimming with Wisdom, is a moving story of two siblings who went their way to reconciliation after losing their mother. Their romance this month is the stunning love and other disasters. This delicious queer rom-com proves that like the best meals, true love is hard work a bit messy, but oh, so rewarding. One that people I know are killing for, and that is no pun, because it is the thriller category, is Reckless Girls. These 20-somethings quickly learn island life is about the little things. Strong drinks, soft sand, cool water, and murder. This month, they also decided to include a collection of short stories, which is Fiona and Jane. In these braided short stories, two girls come of age and learn friendship is both indispensable and a great challenge. And last but not least, we've got their historical fiction this month, and that is the Magnolia Palace. A rich tale suffused with intrigue, mystery, and betrayal that swirls around the history of the infamous Frick family. And one of their add-ons this month is The Maid, and just listen to the tagline of this, a dead body is one mess she can't clean up on her own. And so these are the picks for January, and if you do want to sign up, again, you can use the code MELREADS to get your first book for $9.99. Don't say I didn't tell you, it is the best deal for new hardcover fiction, so there we go. Those are the picks for January. Thank you once more to Book of the Month for sponsoring this video, and let's get right into the contradictions book tag. Is this where I dramatically sip on my coffee because I am about to spill some real tea and expose myself? Yes. For the first question is, I love this genre, but I didn't love this book. You guys know me. You guys can see my shelves. Fantasy is a very big dominant genre in my life. However, although I love fantasy, I think more and more I'm discovering the kinks of the genre that I don't particularly love. And this book just has had a lot of them, unfortunately, and that is The Bone Chart Daughter by Andrea Stewart. You guys know me, bought this book, hyped it real big for myself, thought I would love it, thought it would be a five star, even made it a Patreon book club pick for me and The Citadel, and it didn't really work out for me. A lot of people love this book, I think the majority of the people love this book, in fact the majority of The Citadel, if not the entirety of The Citadel, also really enjoyed this book. I was so frustrated, it didn't matter what format I was reading this book in, started out physical only, so slowly transitioned into the audiobook, slowly transitioned out of it because I couldn't do it anymore. For me, it really came down to messy writing. I did not like the multiple 
POV, especially given the premise itself surrounding Lin as a character, the Emperor's daughter, and it kind of alluding to the fact that the majority of the book was going to be about her, I didn't really expect there to be more than one POV. Though I should have expected it from a high fantasy, I just wasn't really in the mental space for a book like that, so when I walked into it, I was like, oh hell yeah, I'm vibing with Lin, and then I get Jovis, and then I get Falu, and then I get the other girl. Every character's storyline was just getting too messy. I had no idea or patience as to how it was all going to connect at the end, and then the magic system itself felt incredibly shallow to the point where I grew increasingly frustrated with the book because not only were a lot of things left unexplained, but a lot of things were kind of given for certain for the reader of like, ah, but you know what that means. And I'm like, ah, no, I don't. And so the book just had this way of stating things and expecting the reader to go along with them without any seeming explanation. And so I only really wanted Lynn, if that makes sense. For question number two, I have, I rarely read this genre, but I loved this book. And I think I have a variety of different answers for this one in particular. I think usually I stick more towards the contemporary fantasy sci-fi side of things. So whenever I've done experiment videos that is very outside of my comfort zone, or sometimes book club picks also tend to be outside of my comfort zone. And so two books that really come to mind in this particular question are Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky and also All's Well by Mona Awad, which is also in my office. However, both of these books just had a quality and a tone to them that I wasn't expecting to love as much as I did. Like I knew I was going to enjoy them. I just didn't know to what extent. All's Well is this sort of stream of consciousness thriller horror narrative, whereas Crime and Punishment is a Russian classic. And it's, I don't even know what genre I pour this into. Historical fiction, contemporary fiction, social commentary, psychological exploration, psychological thriller. There are just a million different genres that I think both of these books can fit into. And I think the more I go into these sort of weirder books, if you can call them that, that seem much more of a stream of consciousness, I think I find more and more how I like them. So I think maybe the answer to this question is like psychological thrillers or like psychological stream of consciousness, if that makes sense. I think both of these books just messed with me in a very real way where I felt myself pulled into the story and I felt myself being put into the headspaces of both of these characters. So it not only attributes to incredible writing, but how immersive the experience is, or at least was for me reading them. And I don't know, there's just something deeply fascinating about the human mind, which I think a lot of us can relate to. And these two books just portrayed the complexities of our brains so well, where you're just sitting there flabbergasted and wondering what's happening with both of these characters and trying to figure them out as you go along with the narrative. So it was super immersive. It was super interesting. And I definitely want to read more of those kinds of books. Question number three. I love this trope, but I didn't love this book. You guys are going to have to excuse me because I'm literally going on Goodreads because every single book that I haven't loved, I've unhauled and they're no longer in my collection. And so now I'm just like going through my Goodreads shelf. So excuse me real quick while I do some fantastic research. I think I have a good answer for this and they're kind of on the same realm and that is retellings. I love the retelling trope because I wouldn't necessarily call it a genre, but it's definitely a trope and an element of literacy that a lot of authors use to portray a particular narrative. And I have found that the latest retellings that I have read, I have not enjoyed in the slightest. I can mention a few for this category and that would be Neon Gods by Katie Roberts, The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornicek, and also Where Dreams Descend by Janela Angeles. All three of these books had something going for them. The pitches used to make the book were also really incredible and they had a lot of potential. But I think ultimately for me, it was the lack of development in the world building or the lack of, I hate what I'm about to say, but kind of the lack of originality in some of them, not all of them, in terms of the retelling and providing their own twist to it that felt a little bit off-putting to me and that I didn't necessarily love and that I felt they could have as authors provided a lot more for these particular stories. In particular with Neon Gods, it was more so just like a meh narrative. It was a Hades and Persephone retelling. I felt like it had a lot of potential and while the retelling aspects were there and they were very clearly conveyed in the story, I just wanted more from it. I wanted a better conflict. I wanted a better resolution and I think Katie Roberts is just very gifted at writing erotica and at writing smut but when it comes to the world building side 
side of things. It's very hard to kind of combine the two. And so for that reason, <laughs> every time I say I, for that reason, I just think of Shark Tank. But I mean, truly, for that reason, I'm out. Like, I didn't really love the way that this was executed. And even down to the smut, it wasn't even that good in Neon Gods. And then with The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornichek, this was a low-key sort of retelling, like a Norse mythology retelling, except that it wasn't a retelling. It felt very true to the mythos, to what I've already heard and read and watched in series and movies. And so it didn't necessarily feel original in any sort of way. It felt very average as well in terms of writing. And while the voice of the book was good because it felt like a campfire sort of story, I didn't necessarily love the execution because I didn't think it was providing anything particularly new or exciting for this particular set of characters. And then when it came to Where Dreams Descend, you have the Hadestown aspect of it, and then you've got the Phantom of the Opera aspect of it, and the Greatest Showman aspect of it. And while I love all three of those, when I read the book, I was just really underwhelmed with the delivery because a lot of the world building felt incredibly shallow and very underdeveloped. But whichever the case, retellings is a trope that I love sometimes. But these three recent cases were just not it for this girl. On the flip side of things, I hate this trope, but I love this book. Now, <laughs> how do I explain this without this sounding bad? <laughs> I hate this trope. I hate when any author uses it. I don't think it's excusable when any author uses it, but I think in this instance, it was very clear how horrific it was. Incest. Take this however you will. If you've read this book, then you know. If you haven't read this book, I'm sorry. La Sombra del Viento by Carlos Ruiz Zafón. Absolutely hate the trope of incest. I have never liked it. I have never understood why it is used. I guess in a historical context, it makes a lot of sense. In this particular context, it also makes a lot of sense within Latin in culture. However, however, although I hate this trope, it was very minimally used here and it was very clear that it was not a thing that the author was condoning or glorifying. Instead, you could tell how horrified even the author conveyed the feeling of incest. It was horrible. It was disgusting. It was just every bad word that you could think of. He made sure you felt that way because it was not meant to be pretty or again glorified. And so although I hate that trope with a burning fucking passion, and let me quickly move on from that because we do not need to stick to that question for too long, okay? For question number five, we have, I love this author, but I didn't like this book. For this one, I think I'm gonna go with With a Fire and High by Elizabeth Acevedo. I think with Elizabeth Acevedo's books, I typically love the lyrical, poetic, slam poetry tone to them. I love how deeply emotional and how easily emotion is conveyed through the narrative, through her writing style. I love that the majority of her books are written in verse. I think they're beautiful, they're quick to get through, and they just pack a punch. That's the reality of her writing. It literally packs a punch in a very limited amount of words. However, this is her only novel in prose, I believe, or at least the only one that I've read, but I think it's the only one. Did not vibe with this half as much. I think the writing was kind of dry, and then at moments it was really beautiful. And to me, it all almost felt like a crossroads for the author of do I just write prose as per usual or do I go on the more lyrical poetic side and then it ended up doing neither and then it ended up just walking on this kind of messy unfocused path for me. I also think that the narrative per se and the tropes used in this book were not in compound something that was deeply interesting to me or something that I was ever interested in, though I still read it because I love the author and I loved her other works, but this one just kind of felt flat for me in comparison to the other two. And the interesting thing about Acevedo, at least from what I've observed within the community, is that depending on what order you read the books, that's typically people's orders and ranking for her book. So I read The Poet X first, followed by Clap When You Land, followed by this one, and that is exactly my ranking. And everybody that I've talked to ends up giving a similar sort of ranking for the books in terms of their reading order. I previously disliked a book by this author, but I loved this book. There is not a lot that I can think about, and the only author that is coming to mind with this question is V.E. Schwab. However, I don't know how much I'd qualify her within this answer because I did read Addie LaRue first, and that was a five star. Then I read Vicious, and that was a 4.5. And then I read the first two books in Darker Shades of Magic, and then Vengeful. And it slowly started spiraling out of control into a, I don't love any of these books. And so I that's the closest thing that I can come up with for this particular answer. I think her writing for me has been very hit or miss and I also think that in terms of her series and duologies it tends to be very inconsistent at least in my eyes. Darker Shades is some 
something that obviously deserves a lot of recognition. But for me personally, I just didn't connect with the characters. I felt that it was very insta lovey Without a lot of development, the world building also just felt kind of shallow and something that you were just meant to embrace because the author said so. And to me, that just didn't click. And then also with Vicious and Vengeful, I loved the first book. I think the narrative was very alike to heroes and all of these superhero movies that we watch, but with very morally great characters and a narrative that was incredibly complex in terms of human emotion. And then when we walk into Vengeful, it just felt like a completely different narrative while kind of tying in some loose ends of the first book. But I wasn't, again, necessarily compelled to that. And it had one of the tropes that I genuinely love, which is the game of cat and mouse, but it didn't really click like that to me. So it's been all over the place with V.E. Schwab. And so it's interchangeable in a way. But I guess for this question, V.E. Schwab and my answer would be Vicious and Addie LaBrew. Although I have not enjoyed any of her other works that I've read, those two books really stood out to me. I think Addie and I've talked about Addie before. It was the historical fiction, slightly fantasy, magical realism side of it, a pact with a demon, and it was lyrical writing. And it just spoke a lot to my heart in terms of feelings of inadequacy and what it means to be remembered or not, what it means to make an impact in the world, and how sometimes that impact happens as kind of collateral and on the side and inadvertently. Sometimes you don't mean to make an impact and then it happens, and then that makes itself more worthwhile than anything else you could have done as a person. And then Vicious, again, it was very much like to Heroes, which is one of my favorite shows, a lot of morally great characters, a very interesting exploration about good versus evil and about whether good or evil is made or born, how people acquire powers and how that can change people in many ways and how at the core of the book really the question is what can power do to an individual. So I genuinely think that both of these books had very incredible explorations in terms of characters and themes. I love this cover but I didn't like this book. I feel like I'm choosing two books for every answer but also that makes it a little bit more interesting. My two books for this answer would be Normal People by Sally Rooney and also My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix. I know the cover of Normal People has been subject to a lot of critique. A lot of people don't like the cover for Normal People. I, however, really liked it, the, at least the one that I bought. However, I didn't really like the narrative. I thought I would love it, and I genuinely did. I caused a riot almost when I made this a book club pick because people were like, Mel, everybody hates this book. Why are we doing this? And I was like, because I think I'll love it. And I didn't love it. I DNF'd it. I was deeply frustrated with this book. I think while it really showcases what a vicious cycle, love, and toxic relationships can be for some people, and how sometimes it is literally inescapable to escape certain sorts of individuals and how sometimes it feels like you're orbiting around the same person over and over again. What really does it accomplish when there is no development with these characters and their narratives? And that's the part that I found frustrating about this book is that neither of the main characters displayed any sort of growth and it just felt like a toxic cycle of relationships and abuse and sex and addiction over and over and over again. And it didn't really provide any sort of interesting commentary for me. It definitely felt very white gazed. And while there is no issues with that, because I've read a lot of books that tend to have that gaze, I just don't know, again, what it accomplishes. And I just wanted to punch Connell on the face. And in terms of My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix, I read this book last year for Summerween, fully in the expectation to love this because Liv loves this book and a lot of other people love this book. I didn't expect this book to be so much of a satire as it actually is. And I was kind of going into this expecting a very just traditional horror book. I was not expecting this book to grab horror and yes, have all of those elements, but make it a satire, make it funny, kind of make it completely out of whack and ridiculous and completely just camp. I was not expecting that. And so as the story kept unfolding, I was just like, oh, it's so interesting and I love this and it's so compelling and it's just all over the place and I love this. The deeper I started getting to the story, I was like, what's happening? What's happening? What is this? What's happening? What? And so at the end, I was just incredibly underwhelmed about the succession of events. And when I finished the book, I was like, really? And I just felt deeply disappointed because it felt like an incredible setup for the characters and a lot of backstory for the characters that was just incredible to then waste that all on. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the flip side, I don't love this cover, but I loved this book. I don't know if every book I've read just has a pretty cover or what in the world, but I cannot think of a single book that has an ugly cover. BRB. I think for this one, I'm going to use the last thing he told me. Now, I read this book last year and I will say and I will preface, this book is not a thriller, not in the slightest. This book is a mystery and this book has constantly been put in the thriller category and it's not. Though what I really liked about this book was that explanation 
exploration of motherhood through the non-blood related scope. Now when we think about narratives that explore the motherhood trope, if that is a trope, if we can call it that, that trope tends to be handled in a blood related manner. And while that's completely okay, I think it was so interesting to see two people not being related at all and kind of having this hate love relationship, more so on the daughter side. The daughter was not receptive of this stepmom figure right away, never was, and it took a long time to get there. However, the strength and the resilience and the adamance on making this child understand, regardless of whether you consider me or not your mother, which you don't have to if you don't want to, I am here to protect you and I am here to take care of you in whatever way I can. And that devotion through marriage was so beautiful to witness. And I think particularly in this narrative of the father goes missing and now it's up to her to protect this daughter at all costs, it was such a great conduit to explore this dynamic that I think more than anything, that was the interesting part of this book was seeing the trust develop between these two individuals who again were not related by blood but who had some sort of ties to each other and so that's why this book to me at least felt so intriguing not because of the thriller element or because of the mystery element because truly like it was somewhat interesting but I think it was that mother-daughter dynamic that was just deeply intriguing to me. And those are all of the questions now all that is left to do is to tag people so I will be tagging <laughs> I will be tagging Sid from Sid Bookworm, Jalisa from Bandarim Bookmart, Mr. Gavin from How to Train Your Gavin, and Miss Liv from Olivia Reads a Latte. And that is it for today, you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this contradictions book tag. If you want to answer any of these questions, feel free to do so down in the comments. I think it's always super interesting to discuss these things and to see exactly how you guys felt about, again, some of these questions, what books you enjoyed, what books you didn't, based on a regular sort of taste that you tend to have. So let's chat down in the comments about about all of these questions if you felt similarly or differently as well about any of these books let it all know down in the comments so that we can chat and if you reach the end of the video what emoji can we leave like a like a mind blown emoji like my blood. I don't know why I keep doing don't forget to subscribe down below if you haven't done so already. I am constantly uploading videos that I am sure you won't want to miss. If you want to support the channel further, I do have a Patreon. We call ourselves The Citadel, and that is always linked down below alongside all of my social medias. Thank you once more to Book of the Month for sponsoring this video. Don't forget that you can check them out down in the link at the top of my description, and you can use the code MELARY to get your first book for $9.99, which is a steal for new adult hardcover fiction. I also love you guys so, so much, and I shall see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Thank you.